Hello students. Today we'll be talking about general anesthetics. So what are general anesthetics? They're a heterogeneous, meaning a different or a mix, of a group of drugs that produce a reversible loss of consciousness, that's what LOC means, insensitivity to painful stimuli, loss of protective reflexes, which includes like if someone throws something at you, you put your hands up, that's a protective reflex. So you lose those if someone throws something at you when you're unconscious, it will just hit you. And also a depression of the central nervous system. The purpose of general anesthesia is to render a person unaware or unresponsive to the painful stimuli of a procedure. So the person is not aware and they're not feeling any pain when you're performing surgery. So nitrous oxide is under the heading of general anesthetics. However, it's not useful alone as a general anesthetic. However, it is often used in combination with other inhalation anesthetics during surgical procedures. And you can use nitrous oxide alone um, during dental procedures in the office for a patient that may be fearful but it will not render someone completely unconscious. So that's why it's not a true general anesthetic. And other general anesthetic agents that are used in hospitals are used for conscious sedation at lower doses in the dental office. So conscious sedation, here's a big long um, description of what it is. The most important thing is that they maintain, it's called a patent, P-A-T-E-N-T, -E airway. It means they're able to reliably breathe on their own. They don't need assistance with breathing like you might need with general anesthesia when you have the tube put down your throat. So someone that is consciously sedated has a patent airway and a regular breathing pattern. And they can respond if you give them verbal commands, like turn towards me. And sometimes when you're talking to them, they may respond. They may still laugh or they may whimper, they may make noises. So anesthesia may be, um, it's classified different ways. So one of the ways it's classified as stages and planes. And stage one of anesthesia is analgesia. And that means pain relief or reduced pain sensation. So the person is still conscious and can respond. Their reflexes are present. They maintain a patent airway. A patient receiving nitrous oxide in the dental office wants to stay in stage one. The end of stage one is marked by a loss of consciousness. Stage two of general anesthesia is delirium or excitement. So that begins with unconsciousness and is associated with involuntary movement and excitement. As the depth of the anesthesia increases, the patient begins to relax and proceeds to stage three. To ensure the patient's comfort and safety, it's important to transition smoothly from stage one into stage three, and they use a different mechanism or a different mixture of drugs to make that happen. You don't want a patient to remain in stage two very long because you can see here their heart rate increases, their muscle tone, they begin to be have delirium and excitement, they can vomit, they can defecate, they can urinate. So important in the dental office when you're giving nitrous oxide, you don't want someone to enter stage two. And then additionally, when someone is, has general anesthesia in a hospital setting, they want to skip over stage two, that the patient doesn't urinate, vomit, etc. So they use it, a mixture of drugs to almost skip stage two. Stage three is surgical anesthesia. And it's the stage in which most surgery is performed. And this stage gets divided into planes based on eye movements, 
depth of respiration and muscle relaxation. So if the depth of anesthesia in stage three is allowed to increase, the person will rapidly progress to the last stage with a cessation of all respiration. So we want to stay in stage three. So our, our great stage is to be in a stage one for nitrous in the dental office, stage three for surgical anesthesia. Stage four is characterized by a complete cessation or stoppage of respiration and circulatory failure. Pupils are maximally dilated, blood pressure falls rapidly. If this stage is not reversed immediately, the patient will die. So one and three are good, two and four are bad, messy. Don't want those. So those are the stages and planes. We can also talk about steps of anesthesia, and the first step is induction. So when you arrive at the hospital, you're going to have a surgery. You're kind of nervous, lots of things going on. They're going to start an IV, and they're going to give you prep preparations and medications up until the operation begins. Pre-anesthetic medications, all different things, things to calm you down, things to dry you up, things to allow for intubation. So they may give you a benzodiazepine if you're anxious. A lot of pain, um, opioid pain relievers cause nausea. So they may give you an antiemetic, which is something to control nausea and vomiting. They may give you an opioid because that helps, helps to calm you down as a central nervous system depressant. It also provides some pain relief for you post-surgery. They might give it to you pre-surgery knowing at the after surgery you're going to be in pain. So to prevent the heart slowing and to decrease secretions, they'll give you an anticholinergic. To prevent infection, if they're concerned about infections, if you're having a gut surgery, they might give you anti-infectives, an antibiotic to prevent post-surgical infection. And then they may also give you something <clears throat> to paralyze your muscles to allow to place an intubation tube. So all of these things to induce anesthesia to, or to produce it is part of induction. Maintenance begins when the depth of anesthesia is sufficient for surgery, that's stage three, and then continues until the completion of the procedure. So the anesthesiologist or the certified nurse anesthetist will make sure that the patient stays in maintenance to the level of the surgical anesthesia needed for the length of the surgery. And then recovery. So the surgery is stopped or ended, completed, and then the patient is fully responsive and the protective reflexes return. So the goals of general anesthesia a good patient control, good muscle relaxation, and pain relief. They like to use balanced anesthesia. So that means the patient skips from one to three, skipping over the signs of stage two. So one and three are good, two and four, bad. So the goals of the surgical anesthesia, just talked about that, good patient control, so many ages can produce general anesthesia, and each has its own adverse reaction profile. When balanced anesthesia is used, the, pa the patient passes from stage one to three, skipping over the signs of stage two. There are some ultra short acting IV barbiturates that accomplish this readily. So these barbiturates are sometimes combined with nitrous oxide and oxygen combination, which are then administered alongside an inhalation general anesthetic. Sometimes, especially during oral surgery, if they use a local, an local anesthetic, the depth of the general anesthesia can be lighter. The patient doesn't have to be um, so deeply anesthetized with general anesthetic. So anesthetic agents, they can be introduced intravenously through an IV line, or they could also be inhaled. So these are inhalation agents. When you inhale these agents, they very quickly go through the lungs and enter the systemic circulation to get to the brain. 
So there are gases, nitrous oxide as inhalation agent, and there's also some volatile liquids, halogenated hydrocarbons, halogenated ethers, and then ethers. We'll only be touching upon the inhalation agents, the halogen, the volatile liquids very lightly because that's more of a surgical versus a dental hygiene drug. So some of the intravenous agents that they use, now this goes into directly into a vein, enters your systemic circulation. They may use opioids and also the ultra short acting barbiturates. Additionally, um, they may use benzodiazepines. So I'm gonna uh, atomidate. I'm not gonna say that right, but the, the first one that begins with an E. So that's a very short acting intravenous agent that's used for conscious sedation. Um, it has a nice safe cardiovascular profile. I won't ask you about that one. Propofol, this is sometimes called milk of amnesia because it's white when it's going. So if you ever are in surgery and you look down before you become unconscious and you see like a, a milky substance going through your IV, that's propofol. So that produces anesthesia in about 30 seconds and the duration of action is five minutes. Patients feel better and begin ambulation sooner than other agents. So propofol is very commonly used as an intravenous anesthetic, probably the most commonly used. It's actually also the drug that Michael Jackson used to sleep at night and ended up, um, it ended his life. He was too sedated. And additionally, they were performing CPR in a bed. So when you perform CPR on a soft surface, um, you don't get the good depression of the chest wall. You've got to get someone on a, a board or a hard surface. Good to know. Ketamine um, is actually chemically related to PCP. It's also a street drug called Special K, and it's a horse or an animal anesthetic. It's an anesthetic. Ketamine is used usually in children. It gives adults like crazy thoughts and ideas, and they're very uncomfortable with ketamine usually. So it's the IV. I believe this is on your study guide. It says something about the number one um, general anesthetic intravenous is propofol. The number one used in children is ketamine. And then additionally, opioids, benzodiazepines, pain relief, anxiety relief, central nervous system, depression. And these are the thanes, reins, these are the, the halogenated hydrocarbons and halogenated ethers. So they could be liquids or gases. The liquids are vaporized and they're carried to the patient in the form of a gas. And they always use oxygen as the carrier gas. So they're always combined with oxygen. I don't, I'm not going to ask you anything about these agents. So the adverse reaction to the inhalation agents, the one we just talked about with the halogenated hydrocarbons and ethers, is malignant hypothermia. We've talked about this before. It's a genetic and idiosyncratic reaction to some of those agents. It's not related to nitrous oxide. It can be a fatal reaction. The temperature goes really high up because all the muscles in the body start um, contracting. So let's talk about nitrous. Nitrous is always combined with oxygen and has become a primary part of anxiety reduction in the dental office. And the intent is to provide a lightly sedated and relaxed patient. So it provides low levels of anesthesia and high levels of pain relief. Although the patient will still, if it's like a filling, they'll still have to get numb. But if it's just a cleaning, they may just be fine with the nitrous. So some of the advantages are it rapidly takes place, you know, it happens very quickly. There's no injection required. Um, the percent of nitrous oxide is easily adjusted. It's great for children, you know, and if you've ever worked on someone 
that doesn't want to get numb and they're jumping and turning away and closing their mouth, it can be very stressful for the clinician. So having someone that's just kind of being acceptable to you scaling away makes for a very relaxed dental team. So some of the pharmacological effects of nitrous, central nervous system sedation. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have some pain relief, analgesia, and loss of memory, amnesia. Some of the cardiovascular effects, it produces some peripheral vasodilation. So the person can get a little red cheeked. Um, nausea and vomiting are uncommon, but they may occur, and they may occur especially if the patient gets close to the stage two of the anesthesia. You want to make sure they stay in stage one. So who's it good for? person that's afraid, they're afraid, they don't want to get any local, um, and they cannot, or a person that cannot tolerate a long procedure. Contraindications, there's a lot of them. COPD, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Emotional instability, you don't want a patient um, that's, uh, because there is some amnesia, you don't want a patient to say, something happened to them during <clears throat> when they were under nitrous oxide. So always have two people in the room while it's happening. Pregnancy for the patient and the operator, it's contraindicated. Um, if you have in the past abused nitrous oxide, you have a nasal obstruction, if, such as an upper respiratory, Infection or a stuffy nose, so that's an absolute contraindication for nitrous oxide. Um, or the patient doesn't want it, or they're claustrophobic. So sometimes um, patients don't like anything like on their face, and it gives them claustrophobia. So let's go a little deeper into why COPD and nitrous oxide, specifically the um, chronic obstruction of pulmonary disease we're talking about is emphysema. So for most people, your drive to breathe in your brain, your body is telling you, take your next breath. So that's called a, dry, a person's normal drive to breathe is stimulated by the amount of carbon dioxide in your blood. It's not related to the oxygen in your blood. It's related to the amount of carbon dioxide. So regular people without emphysema, the drive to breathe comes from the carbon dioxide levels in the blood. Someone with emphysema in general has elevated levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. So the body does like a, a workaround and starts their drive to breathe by the amount of oxygen in their blood. So when you deliver nitrous oxide, to a patient, you always deliver it with oxygen as well. And when you start delivering that to a person whose drive to breathe, their unconscious drive to breathe from their brain is related to the amount of oxygen in their blood and you're giving them excess oxygen, your drive to breathe may cease. All right, so that's why contraindicated for someone with COPD. So nitrous, ox nitrous oxide equipment, we're not going to spend a long time. If you want to go through all the parts of a nitrous oxide equipment, you can do that. But what we know in the United States, and you know, I'm not sure, maybe it's worldwide. Oxygen is green. Okay, oxygen takes are always green. Tubing that goes from oxygen, anything related to oxygen is going to be colored green. Nitrous is blue. Tubing is blue, everything is blue. So you can see here the tanks can be stored away from the gas machine itself. And then the gas, you see this blue tube here? So we know that's a nitrous tube. Um, gas is transported through copper tubing. There's also portable smaller units that you can move from room to room. And the tanks are on the gas machine itself. And that's good for infrequent use. Like in the hospital, 
like the the nitrous is usually behind the patient against the wall so the tanks um, are probably located somewhere else and then the tubing goes to like the they can quick you know how you do the suction against your wall there must be tubes that attach to the wall in the operating room So here are some parts of the machine, if you're interested. More parts, all about the color coding, where the tanks are kept. Sometimes even the texture of the knobs is different, so you can differentiate between oxygen, nitrous, so that you're never giving someone straight nitrous without oxygen. There's also fail-safes. Um, so an alarm will go off if only nitrous is being delivered, if you've run out of oxygen. D, 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 what else? Okay. Minimum oxygen flow. I'm not going to ask you anything about this. This is just to kind of keep everything safe. But let's look a little bit closer here at the scavenger mask. So I'm going to ask you about the scavenger mask. It's on your study guide. So usually in dentistry, we have a nasal hood. It covers the nose, right? Sometimes we tell the kids it's a piggy nose. So what a scavenger system is, is there are two tubes on each side coming. So for a total of four tubes, two of the tubes, right and left, deliver the nitrous, the oxygen. The other two tubes, right and left, are suctions. And the scavenger system scavenges or sucks up any excess gas because you don't want operators or clinicians that use this gas every day for every patient to be exposed long term to gas that's like leaking around. So that's what the scavenger system is. It's suction tubes um, within the nasal hood. It has a little nasal hood, right? deliver it this way. So even though you only see one tube here, within this tube, there's two, there's a total of four tubes, two suction, two delivering gas. So during surgery, they're going to use a full face mask. Usually it covers the mouth and nose, right? You may have seen that in movies as they kind of come over the person with that gas mask, nasal hood, nasal cannula. If you've ever seen someone in the hospital, it looks like kind of like two prongs, I guess I would call it, or like, how else could I describe it? Like two antlers, like of a deer that stick up the patient's nose. We don't want to use those in dentistry because that means the gas is leaking everywhere as well. And it can cause problems for the operators or clinicians um, having chronic, chronic exposure to that leaked gas. So what do you do before? Well, you get, you know, review the medical history. Do you have a cold? Might you be expecting? Um, do an oral exam, make sure they don't have any airway obstructions, get their vital signs, informed consent. First thing you'll do is you'll activate the scavenger system and then you will begin administering oxygen only. And you'll place the mask, that nasal hood on the patient's face. So when you place the hood, oxygen should be set at about eight liters of oxygen being delivered a minute. You wanna administer 100% oxygen because you need to determine the patient's tidal volume. Tidal volume is the volume of gas inhaled and exhaled during one respiratory cycle. You may need to adjust the tidal volume or the amount administered. Instead of being eight liters, you may adjust it to five liters or 10 liters. So you start at eight liters and you ask the patient, can you feel it a little bit? Or is it blowing up their nose? If they say it's blowing up their nose, turn it down. They say they can't feel anything, you wanna turn it up. And it's hard to 
know whether a person has, like you can, you might look at someone that's really, really tiny and say, oh, they'll be five liters. And then you look at someone that's really, really big and you're like, oh, they're going to be 10 liters. Not always the case. You know, sometimes a person has had lung problems that you're not aware of. And even though they're a really big person, they don't have, they're not at 10 liters. For the most part, people are about seven or eight liters. Um, and you'll adjust it. So if it's blowing up their nose, turn it down. If it, you don't feel anything, turn it up till they feel it a little bit. And we do that with pure oxygen. So then once, okay, so we've set it at eight liters as the person's tidal volume. You'll begin to add nitrous small increments. You'll add a liter a minute of nitrous. But additionally, you have to reduce the oxygen by a liter. The tidal volume must remain the same. So if you're at eight liters of oxygen, and that's what you've decided is their tidal volume, and you add a liter of nitrous, then they're at nine. So you have to back off the oxygen by one to keep them at the eight liters um, as their tidal volume. And then you wait about a minute to see the person's response. And then titrate. You may see that word titrate. It means adjust the gases to the optimal concentration. My recommendation to you for dental hygiene procedures, 35% nitrous and 65% oxygen. That is, means you are going to stay in stage one. You don't have to worry about them going to stage two. Stage one, dental hygiene procedures, we should be at 3565. However, you can see that you have a highest recommended level as 50-50, and then maximum recommended is 65% nitrous and 35% oxygen. Here, you run the risk of getting into that mess of entering stage two. And I say it's a mess because every orifice is screaming to evacuate, they're vomiting, they're pooping, they're peeing, and that's a mess. So we want to not do that. Signs and symptoms of appropriate sedation. Here are the two that I want you to know, because this is what happens when someone is relaxed. Number one, they've got to respond to your commands, right? So that's appropriate sedation. Turn towards me, open a little wider, and they actually do it. The other thing you'll notice, and look at this when the patient's in your chair, when they're relaxed, they're actually, their feet will drop and point outward, all right? So if their feet are dropped, they are relaxed. Now, over sedation, what's happening? So that relaxed person is starting to sweat, and they're starting to move around, and they're not listening to what you say, and, you know, they are just restless and agitated. Bad sign. What do you do? You start backing that nitrous off, right, and increasing the oxygen. Now, when you end nitrous, you turn the nitrous, right? Say you were giving two liters, I'm just going to, two liters of nitrous is six liters of oxygen for that eight liter patient. You'll turn off the nitrous, you'll turn up the oxygen back to the eight liters and maintain that tidal volume with 100% oxygen for five minutes. If you don't give them oxygen for a sufficient amount of time after the procedure, they get a splitting headache, okay? And they're not going to be happy. So you want to make sure you get that oxygen going, full oxygen, no nitrous. And then at the end, also take and record their vital signs. And then you'll do your documentation. Adverse reactions. So complications have happened due to misuse, meaning like misuse might be someone has become dependent on nitrous. Dent that has happened in the past at dentists or dental professionals. Um, at the end of the day, hook themselves up to the nitrous tank. I'll have to look that up. There's probably been some deaths related to that. Um, and nitrous oxide should be automatically limited, fail safe system in case oxygen runs out. You never want to be delivering pure nitrous to a patient. It always has to be combined with oxygen. 
And then what happens if you're chronically exposed? So you don't have a scavenger system. I think that'd be almost impossible today with OSHA regulations. Persons that are exposed to chronic uh, nitrous oxide have peripheral neuropathy, which is pain in like the fingertips um, in your extremities. And interestingly enough, reproduction issues for both genders. And what does that mean? So that means, so you're a female dentist, you um, use nitrous in your office, and you suffer a series. It's called spontaneous abortion is another term for miscarriage. So the, it is when the female uses it, but also, let's say it's a male dentist that has chronically been exposed to nitrous oxide, and he impregnates a woman. That woman that doesn't even work in the dental office is also at higher risk of miscarriage. Now, this isn't true of offices that incorporate scavenger systems and all the fail safes to protect you. This would be if there was none of that, there's no scavenger system, and you were chronically exposed to nitrous. Just, I don't know what the mechanism is, but I just think it's interesting for a person that's never been exposed but was impregnated by someone that was exposed also has a higher risk of miscarriage. And how do we prevent it? We use the appropriate nasal hood, we have good ventilation. The other thing we want to advise the patient, breathe through your nose and don't have them talking a lot when the procedure is not happening. All right, we don't want them talking away. Their mouth is only open, expelling those gases, which the good scavenger system will suck up um, while the procedure is happening. Okay. That's it.